To whom it may concern, my name is Kanyisele Buitabiso Shabalala and this chapter is called The Born Free Generation. Well, hello everyone. Um, so my name is Kanyisele Shabalala and I'll be your host today. And um, before we start, I guess thank you to all of you guys for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, and so our topic for today is going to be The Born Free Generation. And I think even before we get into the nits and gritties of that, um, I think it's important to define, like, how do we conceptualize born free? It's like a generation that came back in the time where democracy, mm -hmm. the rainbow nation, so it's called, came about and where now rights were equal to everybody. So we are like the born free, born in like uh, an era where, you know, freedom was there, but not really there. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think of when, and I'm thinking born free, I'm thinking, yeah, give out money right, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And just from Arnold and Kuzanai specifically, I want to know, how do you then interpret born free as someone who didn't necessarily grow up in South Africa, and so you are only feeling the legacy of apartheid, but it's not something that, um, you know, you felt throughout, well, that's something that you weren't directly affected by, but it's a direct legacy of it now. Um, well, I think I think it's more of like a feeling of slow progress mm -hmm. when you think about born free because I think what people had in mind when the concept of, like came about was not just like human rights but economic freedom as well. Mm -hmm. okay. and I feel like the society is lagging in that respect because how can you say someone's born free when they're in the chains of poverty? Mm -hmm. You can't make like rational decisions when you're poor. Mm -hmm. When you're hungry, you can't make rational decisions. It's just mm -hmm. not possible. Mm -hmm. I think no matter where you're from in Africa, you're all trying. I don't really believe that anyone is free, like he was saying, because there's so much that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And like, if you look at it from just individual freedom, yes, you're able to wake up and you're able to go to work and so forth. But like, if you look at it as a whole, like with systems such as the government, companies, and so forth, nobody actually has freedom. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something that we're all battling. Are we really the born free generation? You know, like we, we defined it for us that it means past apartheid, but has apartheid even has it even started becoming something that's just that's a distant from us? And this is for the floor. Um, well, I think that like in a sense, if you look at what apartheid was and then what we are now, we have more. I guess we have more access to things, even though that access is not equal mm -hmm. at some point. But uh, we, we, we cannot like not acknowledge the things that have happened. That education is now free. You know, mm -hmm. the, the students that fought for you know basic education that we mustn't learn in Africans, that has been done and then we can see that at least education in most parts of South Africa provinces that is happening, even though it's not as equal. And yeah, I guess in that sense we cannot we can say that we are born free yeah. in that sense that like things that were then things that we had no access to, our parents had no access to then we have access to now, same as this university that we are in, that we can now come to university, feel free in a sense, yeah. So that's what I think that we are born free. And I want to find out from you, specifically um, from the perspective of a feminist, how do you then conceptualize um, this idea of a born free when we live in a country where women are literally begging not to be murdered, not to be raped, um, how, how do you then conceptualize it in that framework? Um, so, okay. Um, I think first things first, I think uh, we need to just admit to ourselves that, that the, like, the idea of born free is often used as like a cover for mm -hmm. failures and mistakes. Mm -hmm. right? um, so like you would say something and someone's like, oh, you're acting like that because you're born free. And I'm like, but I'm correcting you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, um, and also with that, I mean, like when I was thinking about this, I, I think the first thing that popped up, sorry, it's a white man, um, it, it's, it's like Plato's allegory of king, um, it's like this philosophy, logic, whatever, where there's a bunch of prisoners that are like in a cave, like tied, like chained to like the wall, and mm -hmm. they're looking at a blank wall, and 
what's happening is that you know they're always telling them to find the light to find the light and one you know one of them managed to escape and i was thinking about that in the context of african continent mm-hmm. and south africa particularly where we are now like that you know our mothers and our grandmothers um people were part of the apartheid like they they were victims chained to walls and they just saw black pictures with no delivery no sort of nothing you know all they saw were just objects passing and you know some people one people made it out of there and like no we promise you we're going to come back and I'll tell you you know and all they do is just throw things like housing here mm-hmm. you know sasa money there but they're not really unchanging mm-hmm. our parents are still also burdened like our mothers yes we might be sitting here like yes, have education but like, how many of our parents are still indebted mm-hmm. you know how many of our parents can't get through day by day that's a struggle that's an excuse for them i can sit here proudly and be like oh i'm educated but why am i educated it's because my mom literally had to suffer you know mm-hmm. on her back you know like i mean black people were taught to believe that the only thing left to the cake is the crumb you mm-hmm. know and she's trying to eat that crumb while feeding to me at the same time so we're all not full we're all having our own issues but at the very same time there's a bigger problem that is about gender based violence that's continuously neglected every time we t- speak about issues of decolonizing and problems in this country you know what i mean mm-hmm. like you would bring it up and like oh it's on the platform right now and yeah. the nc also took the same thing in 1980s you know when um the people who were at the nc whatever at the time the women's league were like can we also fight for our rights because i'm not just a black person but i'm also a woman and i'm also a worker you know they were trying to tackle the class gender and race struggle at once and the nc was like no can we put the emancipation and the liberation of the country first mm-hmm. and i'm like but you know by actually standing with what the women's league was suggesting you would have fixed the like the emancipation of the country but emancipation of women also mm-hmm. and the working class people but you decided to put race above that and that's what often happens with black men you know all these generational woke people now like when you speak to them about race they very quickly interact then you start speaking about gender based mm-hmm. violence mm-hmm. and then it's just like wow <laughs> you know like lights out you know and someone was like how am i in charge and some girl on twitter had to say let me put it for you like this. like men are the white people mm-hmm. and i was like do we have to even narrow it down like that for you to actually understand because even that's inaccurate mm-hmm. because black women it's like black men are only able to stand tall because black women are constantly on their knees just scraping the floor for them mm-hmm. but yeah I'd like to hear a response from the men on this panel in regards to what has just been said. About men are trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, okay. So I think that this is what this is what I'm about to say is honestly something that I feel a lot of people know, especially here. So mm-hmm. I feel like I'm preaching to the converted, but people have always felt like men are trash has always been directed at a single person. You know, when they say men are trash, they say I as tapen or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. My name is Lauren. I as Lauren and trash. Mm-hmm. But what, what they don't understand is that Just like white privilege, just like all of these other things, being men are trash is not just, it's not about me personally, what I'm doing sort of directly in terms of a sort of gender-based violence as that exact aspect, but it's about benefiting from not feeling those things. It's about being able to walk in life feeling safe. It's about being able to go to a locker room and hear these kinds of terrible conversations that are being had, these, object, these objectifications and not doing something about them. All of those things are what make us trash, those micro, um, socialization on a daily basis of what makes us trash. Not necessarily that I don't drink, therefore I am not trash. Yeah. That has never been it. Yes. It's, never, it's not loud and it's trash when they say men are trash. It's, the system is trash. Men are benefiting from the system. Mm-hmm. And when men are not doing anything about it, they are trash. Mm-hmm. That's always been the problem and people have never really understood that. Okay. I think my personal opinion on the men are trash movement is I sort of like that there's contention around the, around the actual tag because when there's no contention then the conversation stops mm-hmm. you see so the fact that people are like why am i trash means that now that this conversation is going to be prolonged and i somewhat feel that was sort of the intention of the actual uh, the actual tag to sort of be heavily confrontational if you said some men are trash and then would have cared if you said oh some guys rape people have been like yeah you mm-hmm. know and moved on but when you have something as intelligently constructed as that that you are you have no option but to confront it i think that's when the conversation continues and um i think it's a good thing yes. yes and um i think all of this in relation to gender based violence um it really speaks to trauma you know what i mean the trauma of existing as a woman as a fem- as a fem presenting body 
Um, it's just, there's all this trauma that comes with this. And when we talk about things like born free, we need to be like free from and free to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, freedom is so complicated. Like, what are we free from? Um, what systems are we free from, you know? But what are we free to do now, you know? So perhaps we're free from the apartheid regime, sure. But are women free to exist? Like, period. Like, mm -hmm. can women just exist? That's a freedom which I, I think we could all say is something which is very contested. Like, women go about every single day, you know, with this hypervigilance, which has just been so normalized, you know, yeah. there's this normalization yeah. of this yeah. hypervigilance. And that, like, I could, as a man, never imagine living so vigilantly every single day. Like, how exhausting, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, to be vigilant all the time and still, like, yeah. have to be nice to people, even though you, there's so many people in this world who, are, who you have to be so untrusting of. And this trauma just stays with people. It stays with our parents, you know, mm. in all its various forms. So they take that trauma and unfortunately, like we've got to say, like our parents project a lot of stuff onto us as their children, mm. you know? It isn't an intentional toxicity, but it is a form of toxicity. Mm. They take their past experiences, which of course we don't blame them for, and they project it onto us and we take that with us into our everyday interactions. Mm. And yeah. Um, like, uh, like I was actually thinking about the same thing now, like um, the narrative of born free insinuates that, you know, like there's no burden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also need to acknowledge that that's a lie, like I yes. said. But also, we're not born free because we're born with, like, what do you call them? Um, generational traumas, mm -hmm. um, like uh, generational, like, wounds and unresolved issues. And we born, you know, our, like you said, our parents, you know, some of them reject, some of them don't, some of them just hide it, some of them are not able to be present because of past events. Mm -hmm. But at the very same time, it's all inherited. So I don't feel like I'm born free because I've inherited a particular type of pain that is not mine while also trying to navigate my current pain. Like it is, it's so much like, like to even understand. It's just like I'm sitting there and I'm struggling with my body as a female, as a 24 year old, young black working class women in mm -hmm. Rhodes University and on top of that I'm still struggling with my mom's own trauma mm -hmm. and oh, she's struggling with her mom's trauma and it's generational because when we sit down there's not necessarily a space to reflect about it because mm -hmm. you know crying is not an actual thing you know speaking about trauma is the most hardest thing you could do yeah. so all of us just sit there in silence and pretend like it doesn't exist and you know our families still believe no the government's going to do better by us it's going to do better by us I'm like we're here three generations of trauma down the line, I'm here and I still don't see the future you envision for me and you still want to tell me that I'm born free because I'm able to enter this white colonial space. Mm -hmm. That is not freedom, that legit is not, the mere fact that it's white and it's colonial and I can't do anything in my own language is also a problem. Mm -hmm. So like, what, what Mbumi is saying here just like reminds me of like, you know, in the township of Kasi, this whole thing of gender-based violence is so normalized that you know, girls my age would think that if your boyfriend beats you, that shows that he loves you. Mm -hmm. And this is constantly being repeated with this society and nobody's saying anything about it that, um, or as guys, the friends saying that, no, you shouldn't hit your chick. It's more like, yeah, like she's teaching, he's putting her in line. Why put her in line in that manner? And why are we keep, why do we keep on saying that if your boyfriend beats you, then that means, I mean, Chomi, he loves you. That's why he's trying to protect you. How, that mindset, from the t like that, that's what I'm saying that this thing has to start from the grassroots. Mm -hmm. We cannot just cut it from the top and start pulling mm -hmm. the tree. We have to go deeper into it, and I guess like that's where the problem starts. We are not working deep into where these things start. Yeah. We're just taking them as mm -hmm. as it goes. So we're just gonna wait for some other tragedy to happen and then start this conversation yet again. But it's not going anywhere. We always catch it at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think also when you're looking deeper at the root, I think culture plays such a huge role because I know. In Zimbabwe, when somebody gets married into another family, they have to go stay there for a week and they need to prove that they can persevere, that um, they're able to fight through things. And even when um, females complain, they're told to shingi that which means be strong. As a woman, you need to be strong. You need to stand by your husband, even if he mistreats you. So it's that question of can culture be stagnant? Because it should be progressive. Like as the times move, like we need to move to like the culture. So, yeah. Um, Dom, in terms of culture from, you know, the Indian culture, um, I was going to speak on the same topic yeah. about how um, a lot of times, like, Indian mother-in-laws are seen as, you know, 
the person that you need to overcome if you want your marriage to work. Mm-hmm. Because it's always, are you good enough for my son? Mm-hmm. Like, can you do this for him? Can you do that for him? Like, you know, things that she should be doing as a mother, you now have that responsibility as his wife. Yeah. Which is, to me, not how it should be. Yes. And um, I feel like there's a lot of expectations placed on. I see. Like I feel like that's that's placed on all women. Mm. But um, in Indian culture, it's more like, oh, look at her. You know, if example, I was I have studied overseas, and it was always a thing of, oh, look at where she is. Like you know, by herself. How can her parents let her go there without a man to protect her? Mm. And like coming back and telling people about your experiences, like I went here, I went there, like you know, I did this. They're like, okay, and like you know, what other boys were you playing with when you were there? Mm-hmm. It, that's the kind of mindset that a lot of the older Indian generation has, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I think it's quite ridiculous. Yeah, I'm just going back to the topic of the born free generation. Um, a conversation I think we also need to discuss is how when it comes, so this is, uh, uh, besides for dentists or anyone else who's studying journalism, okay, but this, <laughs> this is from my perspective, something that I picked up is that when it comes to um, black people doing something wrong, it's always the name is there, there's a picture there um, when it comes to like newspapers, etc, etc. But then here we have Nicholas who raped, um, I think she was 40, a four-year-old girl in a public bathroom, she was caught. And yet it took so long for his name to drop. So my point is that we are born free generation, but when it comes to um, white criminals, it's like an almost um, amnesia about who they are, what they've done. And so I think that's also a conversation that I'd like to open to the floor. Um. I think that something that often is forgotten in our country is also, you know, we have these um, hidden figures when it's a white person committing a crime, specifically white men. Um, And I I think often when a black criminal is outed, white people are quick to say, yeah, I see it's a black person, right? Um, But I think as a country, we also forget that there are people in higher positions committing even bigger crimes yes. um, that, is, that, that, are, that are being covered up because they have the money to do so. Yes. I think of my high school where a boy was accused of rape and he was able to pay the girl to keep quiet yeah. because he had the money to do that, right? Yeah. And his family had the money to do that. And that is not something that we can, we can't pay people to make our problems go away as people of color. Even if we do exist in, um, maybe more so if we exist in the middle class, a space, but I know that if you are a lower class person, you do not have the money or the energy to make a problem go away using those things, you know. And so you have to you have to face those problems or just get on with it, you know. And that's problematic. I think it's it's a problem. Yeah. I was gonna say basically that I mean you actually touched my point, but like um, that I mean besides that the fact that the known fact that like white people control capital, you know, control capital controls the information, you control information, you control institutions, you, you know, this is why I'm sitting here and we're still at Rhodes University, you know, because even after the heavy contestation about this, um, I was also going to say that, you know, a part of it, the, a, a part of the bigger question we need to ask, especially with Born Free and 1994 and, you know, all these um, independent countries now, is that are we really even independent? I mean, independent. Like, did mm-hmm. colonialism necessarily end? Because I'm saying this because um, majority, actually not majority, but all of African countries are still heavily reliant on their colonizers to save them mm-hmm. when they deal in crisis. Mm-hmm. Majority of the Francophone countries, their money comes from France. And I'm like, how are you still communicating mm-hmm. with the colonizer? And be like, hey, here's a, a, a like a more land. You know, and it's it's the narrative that even in South Africa, I mean, we see it now with Sarah Maposa and Jacob Zuma's of the world would rather fly to England than deal with issues that are happening at home. Yeah. You know, we're still heavily, heavily reliant on these institutions yeah. and the colonizers and all of these people. So are we necessarily free? Yes. Is, are we necessarily as African countries independent? Like we're sitting here, because even the African Union, the funding that comes into the African Union, everything, where? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the point I actually wanted to make. Um, because um earlier I believe she had made the point about 
sort of education, having a free education, yes. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question that I had for that was, so Matthew 4 passes, we know that economically, um, people of color have been suppressed, most of all. Now we have schools, high, primary schools, high schools, where mm -hmm. public schools, um, where the, the sort of, you know, the, the conditions of the schools, mm -hmm. those kind of things ran down. But now we have private schools, right? We have privatization of schools, we have schools that are um, you can pay more money to go to a school that has better education. Mm -hmm. So, w when is education free then? Because we know that in apartheid, white people had the money. Mm -hmm. Now we have mm -hmm. a means for the white people to still get better education than black people. Mm -hmm. So, where is the free education? Where is the that kind of sort of that kind of okay? Now, black people, we have education now. We can go and we can make better of ourselves. But no, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. We cannot give people an excuse for not being accountable for their toxic traits as adults. If you have, if you are still in the position to harm another human being and, and you're not doing anything about that, then there's no excuse for you. Whether, Evan, I think accountability, like she says, comes uh, from us as well. Just, just if you're 28 or if you grew up with a homo homophobic father or a, a father that was absent, or someone, or your father used to beat your mom, that doesn't give you an excuse to now beat women. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And that goes the same for our parents. Okay, you grew up in a party, but like you said, you're 50 now, and, <laughs> and if you're an adult, if you want me to respect you as an adult, adults take accountability for their past and take control of their own agency. And I think, I think we mustn't forget, um, as young South Africans, is that there's still hope and we mustn't forget to fight and unfortunately just accept that we are in a war of yeah. some sort mm -hmm. and we have to fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely agree with that. I remember what he was saying was when he said, I know what our parents went through was bad, bad. We all have. No one has a monopoly on suffering. Yeah. Yeah. No one has ever had a monopoly on suffering. <laughs> what they went through, they went through. They had their way. Yeah. They did they did great work. Yeah. They respect <laughs> yeah. But what must be what must be recognized is there are still oppressions. Mm. And yeah. the same way that they were taught when they were young, you are a black child in this world. The legislation says this, you are being oppressed in this way. We have to be taught that, my child, you are in a dual medium school and this is what's going to happen to you. When I was, now I'm here, I'm 20 years old, trying to piece together my identity, mm -hmm. trying to piece together why when I was in a large school, the half the kids in the school used to look at me funny. <laughs> at 20 years old, there were things that I could have been told, you know, written your child, now this is you, mm -hmm. you are in this world, this is how things work, this is what the past said about this and this is what you might encounter. Now go out there and try to make sense of it all. Mm -hmm. It's still important for us to get that armor that they got from their parents because we're also going through our own oppression. Yes, they had theirs, and now we have ours and we need to help. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. But I just quickly have a question uh, geared towards Lawani about because there's lots of things that I wish I had been informed of, a lot of things that I wish I had learned. Because I, I was sent to a school overseas. Uh, in New York, in a very remote area, it's completely white. 13% population of black people. And there's a lot of things that I experienced that I don't want to go into right now, but no one told me, and I wish I had learned, and I had to find out for myself. So if we're going to bring up that case, as a parent, you know you want to protect your child, you want to make sure they grow up believing that they can be an astronaut if they choose to be. Mm. So at what point in their lives do we snatch their child's purpose from them and say, okay, this is the world that we live in, and this is something that you have to understand. This is the reality that you have to go with for the rest of your life, not just today and tomorrow, but Can from this point onwards. Yes. <laughs> the, the greatest gift that the bond that I have with my mom taught me is that people need to come to the table and account. Mm -hmm. As a parent, you need not only to be like, oh, you're blessed, like what you're saying, like our parents have their own traumas, but to sit your children down and hear them. Mm -hmm. Because they are here now. Mm -hmm. This is happening now. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear, it's great if you tell me about what you went through, but at the very same time, you seem to think you've overcome that. I'm in a situation right now where I'm fighting for my life. If you're not going to come to the table, then it's, it's awkward. Yeah. Because really, it's awkward. You know what I mean? We are here now. Do not say, oh, back in my days, mm mm, sis, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the 90s. You know what I mean? And that's what the bond of my mom taught me. Like, I am be like, I don't feel safe. Mbumi, why? And she will hear 
all of my feminist nonsense and when my aunt start calling me out she will defend me to be like she's my child not ours mm. and that's the thing but i also wanted to get into this thing of where we locate the roots i remember when i mentored um young girls from uh all girls school and they were talking about the issue they had with the brother school right mm. and so i was like okay let me have a session where i have all of you and here you guys are you know like kind of like this with, with teenagers um <laughs> And the guy said, oh, it's so hard for me to learn and learn being racist and sexist, you know, because it's great if you teach me all of these things here, but then I go back to my family and like, you know, my family tells me that, you know, all of these things, they, they reinsert all of these things. And then I come back and then I'm a problem again. And then the girl said, well, I mean, my issue here is that I was taught to hate your kind white people because of what you guys did to my black people and I still come to school every day and I look at you like a human being but you, you're not able to extend the same hand to me right and I was like they in high school and they actually having this dialogue yeah. because at the very same time we really need to have this conversation of if we're going to talk about home and I'm still able to leave my environment leave my problems leave my understandings to better understand the world and even go back home and be like actually some of these cultural things you're making me do I ah, ah, guys you know and have that dialogue with my family why aren't you in your privileged position able to do the same why aren't you as a young son able to go back to your dad and be like dad you know some of these things you told me are a problem and then your dad goes to their dad and then everyone needs to come to the table right now and we need to sit down as people in our different spaces, in our different whatevers, and do not ask someone to facilitate that conversation because the truth can be had simply, you know. Mm -hmm. When you go to the bar game by Onis and you're drinking, you can have these chats. Yeah. You don't need a spectator and someone to perform their pain in order for, and people often think that when we speak about these issues, we're having like an oppression Olympics. No. We are saying, come here without issues. Where did they all start? Let's actually have this dialogue and actually sit in it here now. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, someone tweeted um, the other day that, you know, the world seems to think that black women are more beautiful when they're screaming. And that's the actual truth because throughout history, it, we're just screaming, screaming, screaming for our lives. And right now, we're actually having an actual dialogue. And every single time you go on Twitter, there's still, in 2019, a guy being like, oh, angry black woman. In 2019! 2019, after all of the things you've just witnessed, you're still able to sit comfortably and tweet angry black women and tell me you don't understand why. Mm -hmm. No. On that note, thank you everyone for coming and being a part of the first part of the Born Free Generation episode. And um, I hope after this, is, the, this conversation isn't going to end yet. I hope we do continue having it with our different people, especially young people. I think we've established that that's where our focus um, needs to go. And um, yeah, thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.